All right. Um, so let's talk about, we just done a lot of detail about taxes, but just briefly let's go over the things that we need to know about um, registration and voting requirements in general. First of all, every single state in the United States has some form of registration requirement except for one. Any guesses? You'll never guess. Wyoming. Wyoming is kind of close. It's not the right answer, but it's North Dakota. North Dakota is the only state in the country that has no uh, registration requirement. Every other good, every other one does. But registration requirements vary from state to state. Some states, like Texas, use the maximum allowable by law um, registration requirement. 30 days is the most you can be required to register in advance of an election. And Texas uses 30 days. Um, other states have two weeks um, of a registration requirement. They'd be registered 14 days before the election. Some days have, some have seven day requirements. Some states have same day registration. So you can show up on election day and simply walk to one table and register and then walk to the next table and vote. Other states have automatic voter registration. So um, Oregon, for example, has made headlines in the last couple of months because they have automatically registered. Every voter who is eligible to vote in, or in Oregon is automatically included in their registration rolls. So they get that information from the Social Security um, Office and the, um, whatever they call their DMV, um, which maybe might be, might be the DMV. But anyway, um, I don't know. Uh, they, uh, it's different in Virginia, so it confuses me. Uh, and so they um, automatically register people. Um, it's one of the southwestern states, New Mexico or Nevada or Arizona, one of those, um, has pioneered this year uh, and last year using electronic voter registration. People can register to vote online, which you can't do in Texas. You have to physically print out a form, sign it, and mail it in. There's no uh, like electronic submission for registration forms in Texas. So everything has different requirements. Yes? The military automatically signs you up as well. So I found that out. I sent a form in. They said, "Oh, you were already signed up for like." Well, all right. Well, you yeah. So you so I you know that. So I guess the military automatically registers you to vote. Um, you're also every state in the country has to comply with the 1993 law called the Motor Voter Act, which is created. You have to admit, the Motor Voter Act. Motor. And the Motor Voter Act is a law that requires every state to allow you to register to vote when you um, sign up for your driver's license, like when you renew your driver's license. So every state has to allow you to register to vote just during the process of filling in your voter or your um, driver's license application. You guys make me laugh. You circled Monday, Wednesday, Friday. No, that's for attendance, y'all. I have to erase all that. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so uh, the motor uh, uh, requires states to allow you to register to vote um, when you sign up for your driver's license. And so sometimes people don't realize they're registered because all you have to do is check a box. Like when you fill out your driver's license, you might forget that you did that. And then all of a sudden you get a voter registration card in the mail. It's like a you know, Christmas present or whatever. But um, interestingly, the Motor Voter Act did not increase voter turnout rates. Any ideas why? Well, maybe it's that, that certainly people who don't get driver's license are less likely to vote. But um, of people who do get driver's license, it's not like all of them are going to vote. But the thing is that the Motor Voter Act, look at my like super fancy fraction over here. Which of these numbers did the Motor Voter Act increase? The number registered, right? And if you increase the denominator, what happens to the value of the fraction? It goes down, right? So what the Motor Voter Act did was increase the number of registered voters without significantly increasing the number of people who actually vote. So as a result, we actually saw a decrease in voter turnout rates after the Motor Voter Act. Uh, because as it turns out, if you're not willing to go through whatever effort is required, or if you don't understand what effort is required to figure out how to register to vote, you probably aren't going to go through the process of actually voting in the first place or in the second place. Um, so there's that. Um, the states also have different rules about who can register to vote. Everybody requires you, obviously, to be a U.S. citizen um, and age 18 or older. But um, states have different rules. Some states, most states, don't allow anyone who is currently serving a sentence for a felony conviction, um, including both jail and probation time, to vote. But some states ban you from voting for life after you've been convicted of a felony, even after you have finished your sentence, um, which is pretty controversial. Another kind of controversial one is uh, people who have been committed either um, voluntarily or involuntarily to um, a, a treatment facility for mental illness. 
um, are barred from voting until they've been cleared uh, medically. Uh, and again, although we understand, like, certainly somebody whose mental illness is so severe that they can't, for example, differentiate, like, reality from hallucination, we don't necessarily need them to vote. That's probably not a good plan. But on the other hand, sometimes people are committed because they are depressed and maybe suicidal. Um, and, like, that doesn't necessarily impair their ability to, like, judge what's going on in the society. So there's this complicated question about, like, when should people have their right to vote stripped from them? Um, those are more broadly speaking, there's the question of, like, Obviously, poll taxes have been banned, so you can't pay to vote. Um, but one of the, some of the other things that the um, like the voting Voter Rights Act um, like got rid of are things like literacy tests, and we know that literacy tests were used as tools of discrimination in the South. So certainly, we don't want to discriminate. But you know, do we want somebody who walks into the polling you know place and says, "I'm going to vote for all the people whose names I recognize," or "I'm going to vote based on whose sign I thought was prettiest," or "I'm going to vote because um, the I." got a cool hat that whatever like those kinds of people they vote y'all they do and do we want them to vote or should there be some sort of like minimum knowledge to be um forthcoming my answer is that although at sort of a philosophical level i think that people should have to have some sort of minimum understanding of our political system in order to vote at a practical level any in my opinion any kind of test to require that would it be inherently biased right like and would inherently discriminate even if it wasn't intended to so although, again, philosophically, I wish that the people who would choose to vote would be those who like know what the heck they're doing. Um, on the other hand, I think that to try to require that or to make that a policy would, would be discriminatory unintentionally, um, and therefore it's not a good plan, in my opinion. But anyway, it's something to think about, right? Like, um, who do we keep from voting and why do we do that? Um, I'll tell a quick story that I have this college professor that I took his class and then I assigned for his class. And when I took his class, I didn't like him at all. I thought he was really mean. But then when I assigned for him, I learned, sort of discovered, you know, those people who are so sarcastic you can't tell? You know, like, they just sound really mean. And then they're like, no, no, I was just joking. And you're going, okay. <laughs> well, it turns out he's just sarcastic and he's actually really funny. You know, he makes all these jokes that you don't realize they're jokes. Um, <laughs> but I invited him to speak to one of my classes, or to a couple of my classes one year. Um, and he comes in and we were talking about voter participation and turnout and what should we do to increase turnout and all this business. And he, like, straight up just told the class, you don't want to do that. You don't want those people to vote. We're all going. Um, but his point was that whether we like want to discriminate against people or not, um, all of us, you included, are currently benefiting from a system that is um, biased in favor of those of us who are educated. You are currently more educated than a large number of people in our society in terms of like how to vote. You're welcome. Um, and so therefore, you are privileged. And anything we do to get more people to vote is inherently going to get people whose interests are different from yours. Now, I tend to think we should get them to vote anyway, because our society will be better for that. Um, but certainly, there's a sense that, 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 that why don't we see voting laws change? Why don't we move voting from a Tuesday to a Saturday? Or why don't we declare a federal election a national holiday? Or why don't we make it so that everyone can register automatically? Why don't we do that? Well, it's because the people who are already in power were put in power under the current system of who is able to vote, right? Under the current system of who is able to figure it all out. And so people in power are afraid to change that because who knows what will happen if everyone was able to vote or if everyone um, chose to and, and found it easy to vote. So certainly those are things to think about. Um, okay, so let's talk about who votes and doesn't vote or what participation looks like. Um, I think this is titled non-voting on your like, little note sheet. So first, the very best news I have to offer, which is not very good news at all. This is the turnout um, in US presidential elections since 1892. And you can see that it is a very sad story indeed. Way back in 1892, when we were voting for Grover Cleveland, um, someone thing like 75% of the country turned out to vote. That's a pretty big deal. In 2016, when some of us are getting really excited because this might be like a record-breaking turnout year in the past century or so, but still, the best possible outcome is going to be something like 60%. We're going to be so excited if 6 out of 10 people in this country vote. So there's that. It only gets worse from here, unfortunately. So then we can start talking about primary elections. That's the presidential election, like the one we're about to have in November. The primary elections... We get really excited if 30% of people vote in the primaries. Usually it's something somewhere between 20 and 25% of people voting in primaries. What is the impact of that? Polarization. Polarization, right? I mean, like, who shows up to vote when nobody else is voting? 
It's like the same time people who write Yelp reviews, you know? If you write a Yelp review, it's either the best taco you ever had in your entire life or you found, you know, like a fly in your soup or something, right? So like those are the kinds of people who write Yelp reviews. Well, similarly, the kinds of people who go and vote in the primaries are the people who are like so democratic Democrat that they like can't stand it or so Republican-y Republican that they just absolutely hate. Like those are the kinds of people who go. That means what kinds of candidates win the primaries? More radical or more polarized candidates, more extreme in their views. And then, so if we want us to have more moderate candidates, like I for one, would we like some new candidates? Anybody? If we want more moderate candidates, we have to increase, one of the things we have to do is increase participation in the primaries because the primaries really determine who ends up in the, as a final candidate and is in many ways affected by this really low turnout rate. Um, okay, more bad news. So these are presidential election years, right? I told you, 50 to 60 percent, yay, presidential election years. Half of us care, great. Um, in midterm elections, you can see that turnout drops significantly. What is a midterm election? A midterm election is a national election that occurs not when the president is in office. So how often do we elect the president? Every four years. We elect a new president every four, we re-elect the president every four years. How often do we elect members of Congress? Every two years, right? Every two years, uh, we like everybody in the House of Representatives. And senators serve six-year terms, but one-third of them are up for election every two years, right? So one-third of the Senate um, is up for election every two years. So, um, like, in 1992, we elected Bill Clinton. Um, that was a presidential year. We also elected members of Congress and state-level offices and local and whatever. But then two years later, in 1994, we had to have an election for Congress. But it was the middle of Clinton's term, right? So he, there was no president on the ballot. You can see turnout drops. And then presidential year again, turnout spikes, and then drops in the midterms, and so on and so forth. So the average midterm participation is something like 40%, between 30 and 40% for um, midterm participation. Those are national elections with no president on the ballot. I think when your paper is like off years or something, you do want to know the language, midterm elections. You want to know that word, or that phrase. And you want to know what it means. It's in the middle of a presidential term, but we're electing members of Congress. Okay, and then for the really, really sad story, here's a look at local elections. So these are presidential elections. These are state-level elections for, like, governor. Here's local elections. Nationwide, we get so excited, y'all, if 15% of people show up to vote in local elections. 15. And that's really catastrophic when you consider how much of an impact local elections have on our government, right? Like our city council and our mayor are deciding things like what kinds of infrastructure are going to be built, what kinds of jobs are going to be brought into our communities, what do we pay for things like utilities and, um, uh, and internet service, what kinds of policies are put into place for our schools, um, what kinds of traffic laws are going to be enacted. These are things that affect you every single day and yet only one in 10 of us are participating, essentially. But you have a little bit of taste as to why, don't you? You're welcome for that educational experience that I provided to you. And what is that? It is so hard to find information about local races, right? Compare how easy it was to get data for the first race on the ballot, right? For your presidential. So it was really fast, just like open Google News and you had like articles waiting for you. Uh, as compared to even when I gave you articles, you still had some trouble trying to figure out exactly what it is that these people said. And, you know, their websites give you more information about like how many grandkids they have, or like well, you know what kind of what their dog's name is, than it does about um, you know what they actually believe in office. It's difficult. Now, why doesn't KBTX and the Eagle? Why don't they provide us more information about these local candidates who are so important? <laughs> Well, I would argue that more people would pay attention if it was, or more people would vote if it was, provided the information was more widely available to us. But it's not that exciting, right? And usually candidates are very similar. Especially in like highly conservative or highly liberal towns, there's not much difference. Yeah, so the candidates tend to be uh, fairly close uh, to the same thing. The kinds of people who tend to run for election um, tend, you know, they're all from the same city. They tend to have been here a while. They tend to be sort of similar in general. Um, and then, more broadly speaking, it's not seen as exciting, right? The news, they were trying to get ratings, they want me, more people to read, they don't want to publish articles that nobody wants to pay attention to. Um, and so, 
here's my two cents. We have to care more, right? You have to do this, you know, make the effort uh, to figure out who it is that you want to vote for um, in order to make a difference and, and to help make choose better people. So let's talk about why people don't vote, um, reasons they don't vote. Well, the biggest reason is probably um, some combination of like of an ignorance excuse, right? I didn't know where to go. I didn't couldn't um, find a way to get there. Couldn't figure out how to vote. Couldn't figure out what I needed to do to register. Like couldn't whatever something I didn't know. Um, the second biggest reason, um, or maybe the first biggest reason, but I'm going to choose to deny it for the moment, um, is apathy. What does apathy mean? They don't care, right? Political apathy means people who just don't care about politics. I'm just not going to pay attention. I don't care. It doesn't affect me. Lies. It doesn't affect you, right? Um, but political apathy is a big cause for non-voting. Uh, then there's this. Here's some more fancy words for you. Political efficacy. Many people have a low sense of political efficacy. Here's a cartoon that shows you a little bit about what political efficacy means. Do I make that better or worse? Um, so here's a cartoon that shows about political efficacy. What is political efficacy? Yes, yeah, people who don't think their vote matters, right? Oh, I live in Texas. It's a red state. Nobody cares. My vote doesn't matter. Or, oh, you know, the candidates don't listen to anything we say. It doesn't matter what I say. The candidates are all the same anyway. This low sense of political efficacy, this feeling like our vote doesn't matter, as this cartoon presents, I am not so subtly editorializing here, is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? What would happen if all of these people who say that their vote won't make a difference, if they voted? It would make a difference, wouldn't it? So in fact, when people don't vote because they said don't think their vote matters, all they're doing is meaning making their vote not matter. If they did vote, their vote would matter significantly, obviously. Uh, last thing then we'll talk about, well, two things. Um, time zone fallout. This is a fancy phrase that means that people on the West Coast vote less than people on the East Coast, and I'm sure you can figure out why. At 7 or 8 p.m. Uh, when in Virginia and New York and Florida the polls are closing, what time is it in California? Well, California is two hours before us. And so it's only four or five, they have to go three hours behind, right? Um, so it's only, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, they're just getting out of work, and they're going to open their, you know, phones or turn on their televisions, and they're already going to be seeing results coming in from the East Coast. And they're going to go, wow, my person's ahead already, or they're behind already, I'm not going to bother voting. Uh, Hawaii has abysmal voting rates, because if they're, they're even for right now, they're even further behind. So people there, like, they've already halfway seen who's won sometimes before, um, they ever get a chance, you know, before they're getting off of work or getting ready to vote or whatever it is. So, uh, is four or five? Four. Well, they could matter. I mean, we've seen it like in 2000. The <laughs> I mean, certainly there are times when it literally doesn't matter, right, if the electoral college is uh, split wide enough. But in any case, um, last but not least, there's ballot fatigue. Here is a copy of a sample ballot from our, like, from Rex County. Here are our esteemed presidential candidates at the top of the ballot. They're first, so you'll see them first. Then comes our U.S. representatives. And then our representative, and then our railroad commissioner, and then some state Supreme Court justices and state um, uh, Court of Criminal Appeals justices, and then a whole bunch of Republicans running unopposed for various state offices. Some more of those back here. Then the local races, mayor and city council. You all have a lot of stuff to know. And so lots of people go in, they're all jazzed with the presidency, or maybe they care about the Congress position or whatever it is, and they vote for those things, and then they're going to look at the ballot going, I don't know. And they'll either just mark stuff randomly, right? <laughs> I remember that guy had a pretty sign. I like that one. Or, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I heard him speak at some meeting sometime. He was nice enough. Or, whose name is listed first? I'll circle that one. Um, truly, my dad used to help um, run elections when I was little. Um, and they draw lots. Like they, uh, for each race, um, the candidates uh, draw to see whose name will go in what order. Because the whoever's name is listed first, um, always has an overvote, meaning more people vote for that one than we would otherwise predicted because people who have no idea what they're doing will sometimes just take the first one on the list. 
Um, which is why if I ever don't know what I'm doing, I just pick the last one on the list just to like balance it out. <laughs> uh, I, try, I try to always know what I'm doing, but if I'm right, don't. Uh, that's what we do. Um, so balance fatigue is the idea that even if we see 60% of people turn out to vote for the presidential election, on the very same ballot, the very same election, we will likely see a much lower percent turnout for those later uh, races without. People just won't fill out the whole thing. They get so tired. They just can't fill it out, you know? Whatever, yeah. Is it better for them to just choose a random one or not random one? Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? I mean, like, do we want people to vote if they have no idea what they're doing? Or would we rather them just sit it out? I mean, maybe we would rather them just sit it out, but I would rather them know what they're doing. Oh, my. True. Not everything. But you all can, right, and will for the rest of your lives. Now you know how to do it. You know how to find information. I might try to find a way to require, no, I won't require reports for you when you're in college. But really, you're going to need to do it. You're going to have to look it up. You'll have to type it all out. But you got to figure out who's voting um, in order to do a good job. Okay, so um, who participates? Who votes? This is, like, I think, on the next page. Um, oh, by the way, I have no earthly idea what I was talking about when I wrote psychological factors. Maybe I meant, like, I don't even know. I give up. So we're going to be talking about sociological factors. So um, in terms of income, who votes most? The rich. Give me some reasons why the wealthy vote more. Okay, they are probably more educated, so they know what the system, how the system works, or they know what it's like. Um, they probably have a white collar job, which means they have more free time or more time to do that. Like if you're a um, accountant or a banker or a um, I know a business person, or if you work on any kind of salary, um, then you could choose to leave work at 10 in the morning to go vote and come back an hour later, and you don't lose any pay, right? You can just like work through lunch or work late that afternoon or come in early the next morning or just be super efficient and finish it all without, you know, that extra hour or whatever it was, no big deal. But if you're a blue collar worker, if you work a salary or excuse me, an hourly wage job or you work shifts, can you just leave to go vote? Well, you can, but you would probably lose your job. Or definitely lose money if you're paid by the hour, right? You're going to lose whatever time that you were gone. And if any of you have ever had jobs, um, you might know the experience of trying to ask for time off and your boss telling you, oh, no, you can't have that time off. And if you take it off, you'll be fired. Um, so certainly, uh, that does not mean that there's no way to vote for people who um, have blue-collar jobs. Absolutely not. Of course they have a way to vote. Um, in Texas, we have voting on the weekends. Um, the polls on election day itself are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So before work hours and after work hours, the polls are available. But something we should acknowledge that it is easier for some people to vote than it is for others um, because of the position that they have. Um, here's race at the top. Um, you can see um, that this is probably fairly predictable why people tend to vote the most. But I do have something interesting for you about this. So you can see <coughs> that African American turnout tends to be lower than white turnout. But here's the thing. The reason for that is because more African Americans in this country tend to be poor and tend to have less education as a fact, uh, as a result of all kinds of discrimination and whatever it is. But if we control for those things, if we can, if we find a random black person who has um, a bachelor's degree and a sixty thousand dollar a year job, and a random white person with a bachelor's degree and sixty thousand dollars a year of a job, then the black person is significantly more likely to vote than that for a white person of the same education and income level. So although we can see that overall, African Americans in this country vote less than do, uh, than do white people, um, when we control for factors like income and education, they actually have higher participation rates. So I think it's important to note. Um, because you know we tend to see things like, oh, well, this population of people just doesn't care about something, or they're just not active, they're not educated. Well, it's not really true. Um, because in fact, they tend to be more active um, than their equal um, counterparts. This one was a geography. I'll sum it up for you. If you live close to where you're going to vote, it's easier for you to vote, and you're going to do it more often. The extreme example of rural voters, my sister, so I'm from a small town, I told you, but um, not quite that small. My sister now lives um, in a place in West Texas um, where they do have a, like a convenience store, a gas station in their town. She has to drive half an hour to get to a grocery store. She has to drive more than an hour to get to the nearest Target or Walmart, which just to me sounds like torture. You know, like what do you do when you have a school project to do that? Like I don't understand. Sure. Anyway, um, so for rural voters, for my sister, she has to drive a long way to vote, right? She has to drive for 20 or 30 miles to get to a place where she can vote. And so as you might expect, people like that tend to vote less often. Um, old people vote a lot. This is why nobody touches Social Security. But Pell Grants and um, uh, subsidies for federal student loans have been slashed repeatedly. 
Because nobody in the government is afraid of making you mad because they're not worried that you're going to vote. So you need to prove them wrong so you can reclaim your position in the world. Of course, there is like a point at which you become too old. You know, and then... Um, all right, so final things that we can get to a practice question here. Um, there are two basic ways of voting. Um, most people these days tend to vote on the basis of candidate appeal. Um, that's like a whether or not I like him or her, how I feel about them. Do they strike me as a good guy or a bad guy or a good gal or a bad gal? Um, and we can think of some things that encourage that trend, right? Like how the media only covers who's ahead and who's behind. Or how um, advertising tends to be negative as opposed to positive. It's all about why the other guy is bad and not like what your person actually stands for. We can think about things like um, Twitter and Facebook where it's much more about like how you interact with people than it is about like <coughs> <coughs> some detailed policy position. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so all of these things, of course, are going to contribute to the idea of a candidate-centered <coughs> campaign. Um, one more thing that also helps to contribute to a candidate-centered campaign is not the length of our primary season. So think about it. For a whole year, let's say that you're a Republican. For a whole year, Republicans and conservatives in general were trying to decide between a series of 19 candidates who all basically said the same thing. <coughs> They had minor differences about exactly how they might reform the tax policy, or exactly what they would do with the military, or exactly what they were going to do about Obamacare. But all of them said basically the same stuff. And that means for a whole year, the focus was on the character right, of the candidates. What was their experience? What was their education? Um, were they relatable? Were they able to energize people with their rallies, whatever it was? And so these long primary seasons then force us really to focus on who the candidates are as opposed to like what they really believe in. Because for a long time, what they believe in is kind of a moot point. If you know which party you belong to, then you're really just focusing on the, kind of the personality of the candidates. On the other hand, some voters vote on the issues. Not nearly as many now as they used to. Some voters, however, do vote on the issues. And we have a combination of prospective voters and retrospective voters. Who is looking ahead and who's looking behind? Respectively, right? Yeah. Uh, prospective voters are looking ahead, and retrospective voters are looking behind. Prospective voters are essentially always looking for change. They want something new. They're voting for the policies of whatever candidate it is they're voting for. They want this new policy. Retrospective voters, though, then split down further into two groups. Some retrospective voters are looking backwards saying, I like that so much, I want more of it. Some Hillary Clinton supporters today are retrospective voters. They're not really voting for Hillary Clinton. They like what Obama did, they like the Democratic administration, and they're voting for more of that. So they're looking behind and voting on the basis of that, as opposed to looking ahead at what Hillary Clinton is really is, what she's saying or who she is. Other retrospective voters are looking behind and they're unhappy. I would argue many Donald Trump supporters are retrospective voters. They're looking at Obama going, I didn't like that. So they're not really voting prospectively for Trump. They're not voting because they like Trump or want what he has to say. Some of them aren't. But retrospective voters aren't really voting for Trump. They're voting against Obama. Right. So we've got retrospective voters. Uh, so now what we're going to do is take a look at this practice for response question. I'm going to give you about one and a half a second to brainstorm. And then we're going to go over it together. So here it is. <clears throat> So, okay, give me a form of political participation that is not voting. Okay, protesting. Give me an advantage of protesting. Media coverage. Okay, gathers media coverage. Why is that an advantage? You gotta go further for the college board. Yeah, because it publicizes your issue. Publicizes it? Why do we say, you just did FRQ about this, why do we say publicizing the issue is a good thing? It gets it onto the, what kind of agenda? The policy agenda. Okay, another advantage of, of um, protesting? Well, it's free, right? You show up. Um, it tends to reach a lot of people. Give me one more example of a kind of participation that's not voting. Okay, donating money. What's good about donating money? Okay, you can, you can help your candidate get their message out there. What else? 